Today is a new day. Doesn't matter what you've done, the Lord can forgive you. God wants to change our hearts before he changes our circumstances. I believe that God is gonna bring peace in a broken world through you. Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to the Our Power and Thanks for your support to us. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Today, the message of Pastor Bobby Schiller is Choose the Narrow Road. Nowadays, many of us do not choose to walk on the narrow road because we are still longing for the fun in this world. But Pastor Bobby Schiller teaches us we need to take the narrow road that leads to life even though there are difficulties and trials along the way. Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. When we take courage and faith to walk on the narrow road, we can experience personal growth and can fulfill the calling of God. So, don't be afraid to take risks. When we are determined to do God's calling, get back on the narrow road, our life will never be the same. Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Our program is bilingual broadcast. If your TV is the equipment kind of facility, you can choose to watch our power in original English or Cantonese dubbing. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome, friends. We are so, so happy you're here. Reminder that greater is the living God who is inside of you than the enemy who is in the world. This is the truth. You are loved. Amen. We're so glad that you're here today. Just believe that God's going to do something really special in your life and in this week. I think it's so great how you started your week here. Uh, and this is the right way to begin a, a good week, so we're just going to believe for that. Lord, we thank you so much that your Holy Spirit is here and present in this place. We come here in the spirit of worship. We want to lift up your name, Lord, and say thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing. We bring all our cares before you, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I.
preparation for the message, Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. The Word of God. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious
me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ We stand
David Hernandez is an author, speaker, and evangelist whose focus is primarily on the power of the Holy Spirit and healing. He's also an evangelist with the Encounter TV network, including the program Word and Spirit. His newest book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker, looks at how to recognize spiritual warfare and break free from spiritual attacks. Please welcome David Hernandez. David, hi, we're so thrilled you could join us today. Blessed to be here, thank you for having me. Bobby and I are huge fans of your ministry. I have probably watched over a hundred of your Instagram videos. They are truly scripturally insightful and really grateful for the ministry that you do. Well, I'm also thankful for your ministry. It's a blessing to so many I know. Thank you. Well, uh, David, tell us a little bit about yourself and your faith journey. Well, I'm an evangelist. I love Jesus. I preach the simple gospel message of the cross and repentance. And I travel the world, seeing people's lives changed by God's power. So it's an honor and a privilege to be able to steward that ministry. And I gave my life to the Lord when I was 11 years old. I was a fourth generation Christian, third generation preacher. I knew Jesus socially, historically, philosophically, but I did not know Jesus personally until the age of 11 when I accepted the Lord. There was so many things that were happening at the time. I'm sure we'll get into it. Um, but uh, I just, I'm so grateful that he saved me and I want others to know about that. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Jessica, and I have a four-year-old daughter named Aria. Wonderful, so you've been a Christian most of your entire life and multiple generations, I love that. At this point, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so your newest book is called The Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. I love that title. So what prompted you to write this book? Well, I believe that it's God's will for every believer to walk in perfect liberty. I often say something that gets misunderstood because it can sound so insensitive to the struggles that people are facing, but acknowledging that people have struggles and acknowledging that there are issues, very real issues, even myself, um, from time to time, there are instances where I have to bring myself back on track, correct my thinking, that I mean, to say not that you're not a Christian if you struggle, but rather that God has given to us the opportunity, a standard to which we can aspire that includes ultimate freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that is what the Christian life is supposed to be. That is the ideal Christian life to which we must aspire. And I, at some point in my life, even accepted this notion that Christians must accept at least some form of spiritual bondage. But the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. Not he will fight, not he will increase his attack against you, at least for that instance. So I wanted to be able to communicate that message of freedom because I had experienced that freedom myself. For years, I struggled with severe anxiety, even as a preacher. And this is what shocks a lot of people. Even as a preacher, as a pastor, ministering deliverance, ministering healing, preaching salvation, even as an evangelist, experiencing panic attacks in my own personal life. And I couldn't reconcile that. And I was even feeling in some instances very discouraged because the enemy would attack me with thoughts like, well, you're a fake, or how can you preach it to others? And you yourself are struggling. And there were some things that I had to reconnect with in the scripture and reevaluate about my own doctrines and beliefs concerning spiritual warfare. And so I wrote this book because I believe that it's God's will for every believer to walk in perfect liberty. I don't mean we'll never struggle. Of course, we'll have trials. Of course, we'll have instances that are not perfectly ideal to exactly what we want them to be. But when it comes down to it, internally, we should have love, joy, and peace no matter the circumstance. So that's why I wrote it. I wanna help believers get to that place where no matter what's coming against them, they have joy, peace, and victory within. Wow, I, I cannot tell you how every word you are saying is exactly what has been on my heart and rings so true to me. Wow. And I, I had a similar experience um, about three years ago where 
I, the Lord healed me and set me free. I had multiple autoimmune diseases, all these things. I, it, it, exactly, oh. I just felt bondage. And here I am, a pastor's wife who's grown up in the church, you know, why, and just kind of accepting it, like, oh, this is just like a persecution or whatever. But then really investigating, if I, no, no, Jesus came that we could have life and life to the full. And I still remember when he, he with that time when I just got complete freedom and now I'm healed. Like I don't struggle with any of those. Um, all the autoimmune things have diminished from me. And just that song that goes, he, he called me out of that, gr out of the grave. And that's how I felt mm -hmm. just like coming out of the grave into life. And I love your, the title of your book. And I love that you wrote this book because I just think it's so important. And I, I agree with you that, you know, we're going to have, the Bible says we will have trials. He guarantees us that, but he also says we have victory and that there is freedom right. in the Lord. So I, I just love that. Okay. So here's a question for you. Um, I love asking people just when I'm at a dinner party or things like that, but um, do you have a life experience where you saw God move in such a way that it would be in possible to forget. Now, I bet you have a lot, but is there one that comes to your mind where like, I cannot unsee that or ever forget that experience? I would say that there was an instance where after one of the services, a mother brought to me her daughter. Uh, they waited by the side door. Um, we'd like to do a prayer room afterwards. And we came out, prayed with them. And this little girl had a hearing loss. I believe it was in her left ear. And her mother kind of forced her to receive prayer. You know, those times where the parents are like, hey, pray for my son, pray for uh -huh. my daughter. And they're yeah. just kind of looking at you like, please don't. <laughs> so not that <laughs> yeah. that was her posture exactly. I don't know what was going through her mind. Uh -huh. But in terms of her demeanor, she just seemed very hesitant. Like she didn't really want to be there. Like it was kind of an awkward situation for her. She comes forward, her mother's pressing her and please receive prayer. So my team and I just lay hands and they're just asking the Lord, Lord, do as only you can do. We ask you to open her ear. And it was within seconds of praying that you see her kind of jolt like this and her face, her whole demeanor just goes from one of hesitation and awkwardness to just absolute shock. Wow. And she looks at her mom and she starts touching her ear. Her ear opened up right then and there. Now, wow. that of course we've seen time and time again. Yeah. But one of the things I like about this story, which is probably unique to it in this regard, um, the mom actually went back and made the medical staff continue to run tests. And as they did run tests, they, they said things like, surely our machine is broken. There has to be something wrong yeah. with the test. Let's do it again. And so they did it again and again and again because they just could not believe that the report that they had originally filed said one thing. Uh -huh. And then now there was a completely different story being told even on the paper. Now we have, of course, medical documentation of several of the healings, but it's not always that you get to have those testimonies told in that way. So that was one instance in particular. I mean, you, you can't explain that. And I understand, yeah. you know, in, in the medical profession, they say things like, you know, well, you can't necessarily prove that it was God, but I think they have a term for it in some instances where they say like spontaneous recuperation or something like that. But the fact of the matter was she could not hear she received prayer and then she could hear and there was no denying those thank facts. You, and so I thought that was pretty astounding to have that testimony. I love that. Thank you, Lord. So one last question for you, um, David. Um, what encouragement would you offer people who want the life and life to the full that Jesus talks about, but aren't sure where to begin? Well, the reality is that everything that God has promised to you, all that Christ died to give you has already been given to you. It's not a matter of you getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of the Holy Spirit getting more of you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Now, Jesus said, you shall yep. know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That means if you're still bound, then there's a lie that you're still believing and somewhere you have to discover what that lie is, combat that lie with the truth, and then continue to walk in the freedom that God has for you. But I'll say to you that it is yours. It is available. Yep. No matter how long you've tried to be free, no matter how many times you tried to be free, 
No matter how many times you've had your hopes come up only to see them come dashing down, you can, you will be free. The Holy Spirit is your bondage breaker. Amen, amen, 100% agree with you. David Hernandez, thank you for sharing with us. God loves you and so do we. Thank you. Well, whoever you are, would you stand with us? Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Holy Spirit. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks. You can be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to begin by asking you a question. I'm wondering if maybe you've lost your way. It's happened to all of us at times. Life gets hard. We face temptations. We face trials. Maybe at one time in your life you went to church with your grandma or you had, went to Sunday school or maybe one time you had some kind of a faith but you lost your way. Maybe you feel far from God. You don't really know, you know if God is with you or if you're at peace with the Lord. I want to encourage you today to make a decision to follow Jesus. If you make that decision, your life will never be the same. He was crucified for our sin. He was raised from the dead so that we could be in heaven with him. Invite Christ in your heart today. And if you do that, I know you'll never be the same. When I look at the world that we live in today, this is God's world, you know? God made this world. Yes, it's fallen. Yes, it has flaws. Yes, there's danger. There's all sorts of things. God made this world. It's his world. And this world has, is so full of opportunity, of doors, of possibilities, of life. All these things are available to you and to me if we believe. And Jesus has provided us the many tools we need to access this life that's full of opportunity and possibility. Amen? And so I want to talk about those tools today. But first, let's open the Word of God to see what Jesus actually says in Matthew chapter 16. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me We'll find it. Famous passage, right? We've grown up in church. You've read that many times. It is what it says it is. It's true. This story begins in a place, if you uh, remember, there was a sermon I gave long ago in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And this is where Jesus tells the story. You might and so Jesus, when he's there, he tells Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock. Jesus is pointing to this rock. On this rock, the rock of the gods, I will build my church. What is he saying? I want you, the, my disciples, to go here. I want your world to be bigger than your synagogue. I want your calling to be bigger than just reading your Bible, although that's very important. I want you to go to the places you feel uncomfortable in, to reach people here who are obviously lost and in need. I want you to go there. Here's what happens in our world. Endless partying is what happens when someone loses their soul. This endless partying is what happens when somebody begins to lose their life. I think that today we're always looking for what's more entertaining, what's more fun, what's more enjoyable. I love a good laugh. I love a good party. But this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about this obsession with constantly needing the next hit, the next thing. So seizing life is not about fun, it's about becoming a person. And this is really the message that Jesus gives us about laying down your life to seize it. Here's another way of saying it. Jesus said it like this. There's two paths. You remember this, don't you? There's two paths. There's one path that's really, really easy, but it leads to a dead kind of life, a dead life, death. And then there's this other life, this other road. It's very hard, it's narrow, it's difficult to tread, but it leads to, it leads to life, real life. The kind of life 
you were born to have, the kind of life you really want. And that life is waiting for you. That life is waiting for you right now. That life is calling out to you. It's calling out to you. But the only problem is between you and that life is a difficult road, a narrow road, a hard road. I think most of the people that are in this church right now, and most of you who are watching on television would say, I believe that. I believe that the thing between me and my dream is a hard road. I believe that there's this amazing thing that's set aside for me that I can't uh, seem to find. I believe that. And I'm going to get on that road tomorrow. I'm going to get on that road when the economy gets a little better. I'm going to get on that road when I get a raise, you see? And this is the trick, is that many of us, we believe the road is there, we believe the calling is there, but we still have not taken the first step to be on that road. So why not? Why not take the road? Why not take the narrow road if you believe it to be true? If you believe it's real? If you believe that there's this great thing waiting for you? Why not take that road? And here I want to t talk to you about the four why nots. There's four why nots that I think every single person says and why they don't get on the narrow road that leads to life. Here's the first why not. It's because the road seems bigger than the prize. Now, I want to encourage you today, friends. What we're going to see today is going to change your life. I want you to take notes. Don't trust your brain. You say, I'll remember it later. You won't remember these things later. You can take your phone out and take a picture. You can take your phone out and take notes. You can take out a sheet of paper and write it down. But I want to encourage you, okay? Many of us, we're not on the road we need to be on because the road seems bigger than the prize. Jesus tells us something like this. It's like there was a man and he was wandering around some land and he saw this bit of wood or something sticking out of the ground. At first it looked like a root, but then he decided to take a, quick, a closer look, dig around it, and he found, whoa, it's a treasure chest. And inside was this immense treasure. Quickly he buries, buries it up again. He recognizes that what's in that box is worth so much. So he goes and he does everything he can, sells all that he has, even all of his clothing except the clothing on his back, goes back to the landowner, buys the land, and gets this great reward. You say, well, that was too expensive. And he says, no, sir, it was not. You say, that cost a lot. But look at what? The prize. Look at the prize. Look at the reward. The prize is worth it. Can we just say that your victory is worth it, is worth the price? Can we say that your health is worth it? That your finished book is worth it? That the people you lead, it's worth it? Your dream is worth it? I want to encourage you, friend, fall in love with your dream again. If you fall in love with your dream, if you know what it looks like, if you can taste it, if you can see it, if it's in your bones, if it's in your blood, the, the narrow path that you're called to walk gets easier and easier, and you get more and more excited. And there's the second point. Here's the little secret about the narrow road. The narrow road itself is part of the prize. What do you mean, the narrow road? You know, there's a story in the Bible about ten lepers who always wanted this great healing, and Jesus goes to them. You know, normally Jesus, when he heals somebody, he touches them and they're healed, and that's it. It's a one and done. But in this story, he says, go to the temple and show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Now, I think this is true for us. When we're called to do something for God, there's an as they went moment in many of our lives. There's something about the actual path itself that is also a prize. The excitement of the dream itself, the hope of the calling, the challenge that you face like a game, the personal growth you experience within yourself, the friends you make along the way. The path itself isn't as bad as it looks because the path itself is also the prize, the person you become. My friend, I'm telling you, choose the narrow road. Choose the narrow road. Okay, here's another thing about this narrow road and its difficulties. Jesus tells us that when you follow him, his burden is easy, but it's still a burden, right? And his yoke is light. And that you've got to take up your cross and follow him. Easy choice is hard life. Isn't that the truth? So choose your hard. Marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Being fit is hard. Being unhealthy is hard. 
Creating is hard. Being unfulfilled is hard. They're both hard. Telling the truth is hard. But living every day haunted by guilt, that's hard too, isn't it? So choose your heart. But then it's also easy in a way. It's kind of easy. What do you mean it's easy? It's like this. The things that we really need to do to get the life we want, it's really just calling on us to do a little bit more than we have every day. It's like this. It's actually easy to read your Bible for five minutes a day. How hard is that? Who here thinks it's hard to read your Bible for five minutes? It's easy, right? It's easy to read your Bible. It's easy to write down your goals. It's easy to pray for someone when they're hurting. It's easy to reflect when you're in bed and think about how your day went. It's easy to get eight hours of sleep. It's easy to treat people decently. It's easy to attend church on Sunday. It's easy to start. It's easy to start that project, that dream, that song, that whatever it is you're called to do. So then why don't more people do it? Because it's easy not to do. Isn't that the truth? So choose your hard and choose your easy. Choose your hard, choose your easy. All right, that was a long description for number one. That's the first reason why a lot of people don't get on that narrow road. Here's the second reason why a lot of people don't get on the narrow road. That leads to life. This is a sad one. We've all been there before. Maybe you walked the narrow road once in your life. Maybe you were on the adventure. Maybe you were going down the path and you fell off or you got burned or something bad happened. Here's the number two reason. It's because you say to yourself, I can't go through that again. You ever feel that way? Some of you, you're walking the narrow road. You know, the narrow road is dangerous, isn't it? No one said it was easy. It's dangerous. And maybe when you were on that narrow road once in life, you fell into a deep winter. You fell into a deep pit and you couldn't get out and you were all alone. You fell off a cliff. You did all the work, and for no reason of your own, all your crops got wiped out by the hailstorm. And you just say, I can't do it again. Maybe you had multiple miscarriages. Maybe you went through a divorce, and you just say, I can't get married again. Maybe you went through a detox and now you've fallen off the wagon and you can't go through that again. Maybe a lawsuit. Maybe you were wounded by religious people and you just can't find your way back into a church or back into God's life again. You just say, I can't go through that again, Pastor Bobby. Let me say this to you. If you try again, if you try again and you get the victory, I promise you'll look back and you'll say, I'm so glad I tried again. You say to me, well, what if I don't get the victory? Well, that's true. But here's what I can guarantee you. You won't get the victory if you don't try again. A wise man once said, I'd rather attempt to do something great and fail than attempt to do nothing and succeed. You say, I can't go through it again, my friend. Never underestimate what you and God can get through together. I know the living word of God inside of you can carry you through all you need to get to. So get back on the road to life. It's where you belong. All right, number three. Here's the number three reason why most people have a tough time getting back on the narrow road that leads to life. You say something like, my friends, my colleagues, and my family, I gotta tell you, Bobby, they will not like it. Your friends or your colleagues or your neighbors or somebody you know said something, and I just know they're not gonna like it. This is a huge thing that keeps us from being all that we were called to be. I remember when I made a decision to follow Christ, I grew up in church, I grew up in a Christian family, but when I was 15, I really had gotten in a spot where, you know, it was not something personally for me, and None of my friends really were Christians. And I remember when I made a decision to follow Christ, I knew that they were not going to like it.
yet I felt like what it was God, God was calling me to do. And we did it, we brought it together, and guess what? Most people kind of liked it. And so it was all in my mind. We play these games where we just project onto people that love us that they're not gonna like it, or they're gonna put immense pressure on us to not do it. And maybe they will, but guess what? Maybe they won't. In the end, you'll be glad you did it. You never know. People talk, people threaten, people say this, people say that. Do what you're called to do. And don't become a doormat and don't let people push you around. Yes, be nice, don't be rude, but do what God calls you to do. It's full of executives and doctors, attorneys, people who have done well, educated people. Here's the biggest danger of all for the narrow road, for people like that, uh, is this reason. I've got it pretty good. Why risk a decent life for a great life? I've got it pretty good. I've got a nice house. I've got a nice family. Things are going fine. I got some money saved up. Things are looking up for me. Why would I pursue a new dream? Things are good. I don't want to risk it all. Risk it all. Here's the reason why. Here's the reason why you still go on the narrow road, even when you've succeeded in the past. Here's the reason. The man said, we have two choices in life. To become all that we were made to be, or to be less than we were made to be. Every day, you have a choice to make of your life. To be all that you were made to be, or to be less than you were made to be. Human beings are the only creatures that can do this. Every tree grows as big as it can. Every animal does what its instinct tells us. We have the dignity of choice, to be as big as we can, or to be less than we can be. If you can see the narrow road, that means it's calling to you. If you can see the dream, if you can see the path, if you can see the price, that means that the thing itself has chosen you to walk on that path. Here, let me ask you another question for those of you who are worried about losing your pretty good life to get a really great life. When was the last time you felt really alive? Now, some of you say, I feel really alive right now, and that is great. But some of you will say, it's been some time. But I'm a good man, a responsible woman, a good person. I'm, you know, faithful, and that's good. But when was the last time you really felt alive? And I'm going to wager, the last time you really felt alive was the last time you were building something. Or it was the last time you were making something. It was the last time you were writing something or struggling to be better. It was the last time you were reaching out. It was the last time you were making an impact. That was probably the last time you felt really, really alive. You weren't looking for a safe life. You were looking for a great life. You weren't looking for an easy road. You were looking for the pearl of great price. And even now, you can kind of feel it calling out to you. Don't turn a deaf ear to your calling. Why do you think life goes so fast? This is a big question that many people face. Why does life go so fast? Why does it feel like the years go just flying by? You want to slow down your life? I'm about to give you the answer. Here it is. Your life slows down when you have new experiences in your memory. So the reason why children, their life goes so slow is every day is a new day, everything's a new thing. A new book, a new idea, a new friend, a new haircut, all of these count as something new. You do something new, your life slows down in your memory. And you can actually test this, they've seen it, that people who, be, who get out of the rut and the rhythms of everyday life, their life begins to slow down. I remember something happened to me in COVID. This is the slowest year ever, but in a good way. Why is it slow? I'll tell you why. I don't watch TV. I'll tell you why. I make, I try, and am I perfect at this? No, I still waste time, but I try every day intentionally to make every sip of coffee count, to make every bit of eye contact count, to make every word count, and I commit every, as much of my life to personal growth as I can. What I'm asking you to do today, I'm asking you to do it because it's been a gift to me, because it's transformed my life. We call it discipleship. It's the missing part of Christianity that has been forgotten in churches, the daily commitment to be more like Christ. And so when you do that, when you commit your life to more, to be more, to do more for God, 
Your life gets bigger, and guess what? Your life gets longer in terms of how you experience it. It gets sl slows down in just the way you want it to. So, do as much as possible. Be as much as possible. Touch as many lives as you can. Pray for as many people as you can today. Give as much as you can. Make as many friends as you can. Earn as much as you can. Read and study as much as you can. Create as much as you possibly can. And most of all, grow as much as possible for you. I want you to get back on the narrow road, and I know your life will never be the same. Father, we ask for that in Jesus' name. We pray that you'd bring us back to the narrow road that leads to life. And we pray that if we lose some people along the way, that you bring alongside us the right kind of friends. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Hark, I hear the heart's eternal ringing on the farther shore. As I near those swollen waters with their deep and solemn roar. Alleluia! The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for watching our power in your support to us. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Today, the message of Pastor Bobby Schiller is, Choose the narrow road. Nowadays, many of us do not choose to walk on the narrow road, because we are still longing for the fun in this world. But Pastor Bobby Schiller teaches us, we need to take the narrow road that leads to life, even though there are difficulties and trials along the way. Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. When we take courage and faith to walk on the narrow road, we can experience personal growth and can fulfill the calling of God. So, don't be afraid to take risk. When we are determined to do God's calling, get back on the narrow road, our life will never be the same. Enter through the narrow gate, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few found it. 
Our Power This Motivational TV program is broadcast weekly on TVP Pearl Channel. Every Saturday at 10 a.m. in the morning and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And you can also watch online simultaneously on My TV Super or www.ourofpower.org.hk. Thanks for joining. God loves you and see you next week on TVP Pearl. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.